Well, welcome aboard, everybody. Welcome to the Pastor Mike Drop podcast. I'm really, really excited about today's show. Uh, Co-host Emily is with me, and we have two special guests, Merv Thompson and Dave Johnson. Welcome aboard, guys. Thank you. Good to be here. Really glad you're here. Dave and Merv are on our staff here at Hope uh, part-time. They're retired from full-time ordained ministry, but we are so blessed to have them here serving in in a mentor role for so many of us as church leaders. Uh, I'm really, really glad you guys are here today because I want to get into the topic of the once and future church. Uh, We want to talk about where you've been, what you've seen, and there aren't in the entire Lutheran church. I mean, we're talking about a long, long history. We're talking about millions and millions of people. Uh, We're talking about all sorts of tradition. In the history of the Lutheran church, there aren't two people um, better suited to talk about this topic than Merv and Dave, because uh, you are both well known in Lutheran circles as innovators. Uh, you pioneered some things that nobody else had the courage to try, or maybe uh, had the idea or the innovation to try. Uh, and so, I want to ask you about those things. And Emily's along to to join into. Hello, Emily. How Hello, are you today? I'm great. It's good to see you, Merv. Uh, tell us just a little bit. We have a little getting to know you part here. So, uh, where'd you grow up and what was that like? Well, uh, shocking to many people here at Hope, I was born in Iowa. Uh-huh. My dad was a music teacher in Pomeroy, Iowa. God's country. God's country. <laughs> and when I was six months old, my dad decided to go to seminary, so we moved to, uh, to St. Paul, and that's where I was raised. I was raised the first half of that in, uh, by McAllister College, and then we moved over by the Minnesota State Fairgrounds. And I, uh, my family lived there for about 20 years after that. Hmm. Uh, and so uh, it was a great place to grow up. And I loved the Minnesota State Fair when I was a kid. We, I went every day. Hmm. And I still need to go to the fair when it's on each day. So raised in St. Paul. That's, I had forgotten that you were born in Iowa, and so uh, it's, it's like this great homecoming now. You're, right. you're finally back, back. In, into this place <laughs> where it, it's heaven. No, it, it's Iowa, right? And, and good to have you back. Dave, same question. Uh, yeah. what, 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 where'd you grow up, and what was that like? Uh, grew up in Moorhead, Minnesota, um, right across the river from Fargo, North Dakota, ironically, because I ended up serving in Fargo. Um, it was... Uh, a great childhood. I was very interested in sports. There were very many opportunities for me to pursue, pursue that interest. Um, there was, it was kind of an age of innocence and, and an huh. age that I re, you know, reflect upon right now. And I, I, I think about the fact that I never remember as a kid being concerned about my personal safety. Mm-hmm. And that's just one example of how different society seems to be today than it was then. Yeah, that, that it is a different time for sure. Dave, uh, we both went to the same college, uh, Concordia mm-hmm. College in Moorhead. You too, Merv. Uh, in fact, you guys were classmates, weren't you? Or at the same time? Yeah. You were at the school at the same time? Yes, yep. we were. And uh, I heard a rumor, Dave, that you were the starting fullback for the Concordia College football team, and quite good, too. <laughs> All yeah. conference. Yes, yes, yes. yes. No, and and I get better every year. (laughs) (laughs) Just just ask. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, if if we have time, we'll we'll, we'll get to that. Emily, were you the starting fullback? I wasn't, but thank you for asking. (laughs) So where did where did you grow up, and what was that like? I grew up uh, in Des Moines. Uh, here in West Des Moines, I went to Valley High School. And Go Tigers! I, yes, and I've been at Hope since I was a fifth grader. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's yeah. awesome! And now you're a senior leader here at Hope, yeah. and yeah. amazing how that works. So let's get right into it. Let's start our two-minute drill. Want to ask these innovators uh, who've seen a lot, and they've got the arrows in their back to prove uh-huh. it too. <laughs> Uh, because anytime you blaze a new trail, you're going to get some criticism, too. So mm-hmm. Merv, really, among many other things, changed the way uh, that Lutherans worship, or at least opened that door of opportunity. So that leads to our first question in the... Two-minute drill! Two-minute drill! It mm. does. Okay, so first one to you, Merv. What inspired you to bring rock music to worship? Well, when I became a pastor in, in 1965, uh, the... Um, um, church was at a high point. It was growing. Thousands of new congregations were being started. It looked like we were entering the golden years for the church. Hmm. Our seminaries were full. um, And so, um, but then the 60s happened. And uh, my last day of exams, my first year at seminary, I walked out and I heard John Kennedy, President Kennedy, had been shot. Hmm. 
<laughs> and everything changed after that. We had Watergate, and we had Vietnam, and we had we had riots in the streets, and we had assassinations, and and interest in religion just plummeted. And by the end of the decade, fourteen percent of the people said religion was important. After you know, early in the year, century, in the decade, it was seventy percent. So all of that affected us as parish pastors, and I noticed that young people weren't coming to church like they had been, and, and the interest was waning, and we had to try to figure out. So I, I thought, what can we do to change worship so it would be more appealing to young people? So we thought, well, let's change the music. And so we started with folk music, and uh, because that was easier. We didn't have drums. Drums seemed to be a big deal. <laughs> so we didn't have drums, so we could we could sing with guitars, and we had John Elvisacker was the leading Lutheran musician at the time and we had songs by peter paul mary and simon and garfunkel and all these kind the the peak was in 1970 the national youth convention the theme was bridge over troubled waters (laughs) and the and the guest artist was pete seeger that's that was the height of folk music well then the jesus people revolution happened in california and suddenly they started writing these long-haired hippies started writing rock music rock and roll with Christian words. And we found some of that music and loved it. So we instituted it. We were probably the first Lutheran church to start uh, rock and roll music, kind of like what Hope is doing now in 1970-71. And not everybody in the Lutheran church was in favor of that. (laughs) Yeah, you you guys kicked the door open that that we've been able to walk through in many, many other churches. So thank you. Yeah, second question. Uh, Lutheran Church of Hope is a multi-site congregation. Dave, you started a second campus at your church, Hope Lutheran in Fargo. Why did you do that? Well, we got to a point in, at, uh, at Hope that we were running five services on a Sunday morning, and there just wasn't space. We were going from the sanctuary in one end to the fellowship center on the other end, and uh, so what were we to do? What do you do with you got all that energy and momentum and God seems to be calling you? And uh, one day I was just uh, sitting in that room uh, at the, uh, and I looked at the wall and I thought for a moment, what would happen if that wall fell down? <laughs> what could we become? And the idea at that point began to come into my mind could hope ever be deputized to go on the south side of Fargo, which was just exploding, and uh, and begin a, a new Lutheran presence. Mm. And so, uh, first I had to get permission from the church, and had some wonderful people that uh, made some key decisions that enabled us to go forward. And then the big thing was to get the okay from the national church, because we were going to do it uh, within uh, the uh, church's pur- uh, purview, so that's the way that happened. And you got that approval, but you also probably got some pushback. Oh uh, yes, I would think too from oh, yes. from others. What, yes. how did you handle that? Oh, uh, it was hard. It was discouraging. I'll tell you, it was very interesting. Um, across the river in Moorhead was Rick Foss, mm. and Rick was a great pastor. And uh, I remember I was just had this idea, could we ever become a a two-site church? And I went over to Rick's place to see him. And uh, when I went in the office, the secretary said, no, he's he's down with... Uh, at the um, at the local sandwich shop, he's uh, having lunch with Peter uh, Foss, and so I said, I think I'll go over there and see him. And I went over there, and as soon as I saw him, uh, I said, Guys, can I sit down? I said, I got this idea. Could you think uh, Hope could ever be deputized to start a second site? And Rick said. Well, let's go out and look for land tomorrow. <laughs> it's, it's good to have some champions for ideas, yeah, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Yeah, great. That's Thanks, good. Dave. Yeah, that's good. The next one is a big, broad question. It is, what's the state of the Lutheran Church today and in the future? Merv, you recently wrote quite a lot on this. Why don't you kick us off? There was an article by a Luther Seminary professor recently that said that if current trends continue, if current trends continue, In 20 or 30 years, the ELCA will no longer exist. That got my attention uh, because I uh, love the ELCA and have been a part of it all my life. 
so I've been trying to think about that more, and um, there are all kinds of signs that uh, that are difficult to see. Uh, we we used to have 5.3 million ELCA people in 1988 when the ELCA was formed. Now we're down to about three million, and the estimate is we'll have 16,000 by. 2040 which which really has awakened a lot of conversation about yeah. this i mean that that's an alarming study alarming study and and this is not coming from the professor it's coming from statistics from the elca right uh, as they look at it so that uh that is very discouraging to see that and that means that um the denomination will disappear it means that most congregations will close it means the seminaries and church colleges perhaps will be affected so there's ramifications everywhere, and uh, so that's why I wrote a paper on on how can we respond to this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a it it is a it is a massive uh, s- study, and it's it's sent shockwaves really uh, mm-hmm. uh, amongst church leaders mm-hmm. all over, not just the Lutheran Church but other mainline churches too, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because mm-hmm. there's no group of of Christians, uh, whether it's mainline evangelical, Pentecostal, Roman Catholic, that's really immune from this. Mm-hmm. Right. And and so, it speaks to the Lutheran Church, but it's really a symptom of a much bigger challenge that's mm-hmm. before us at this time. Mm-hmm. That's big. That's a big deal. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a huge, huge deal. deal. It's it's changing life and church as as we know it, or the potential for that. Mm-hmm. So, but 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 we also we also want to talk in the deeper dive about um, about the poss- uh, about the things that God is doing. And the potential for that to turn around because we see signs. So, there are signs of hope. Mm-hmm. Good. Next one. What do church leaders need to know that they might not know? Yeah, you you guys here serve in the role of, of we jokingly say you're Yoda and Obi Wan Kenobi. So you, <laughs> you, you you and you've both been leaders uh, in the church in teaching other church leaders uh, in in your time as senior pastors. You had conferences and people would come. Dave, they'd come to you to talk about how do you start satellites and second and third campuses. Merv, they'd come to you. You had a conference called The Changing Church for a Changing World that all sorts of church leaders flocked to over the years. Uh, what is it what what is it that church leaders need to know right now that they they don't know from your perspective and based on your experience? I I think it begins with uh, to ask ourselves just how important the gospel is to us. What we've experienced. What would life be like without Jesus in our lives? Hmm. And uh, then to to see that lost people matter to God and they should matter to us. And uh, to be open to the ways of the Spirit, to be able to bring the gospel in a new era, in a new time. Yes, it may be negative, these words, but also there's got to be opportunities within this. And I think the opportunities will come if we will open ourselves up and ask ourselves, where does God want us to be, and how can we be shaped and formed to the uh, challenges that are in front of us? Yeah, that's great. Merv, what do you see? Well... I I always talk about vision, structure, staffing, <laughs> and what is the vision? And my view has been that uh, uh, God's vision is always much bigger than my vision or our vision. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the the mustard seed, or you look at the uh, Luke fifteen about the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, uh, or the Great Commission, you see that what what God's heart is, and so. It seems to me that what leaders need to know is that God's vision is is bigger than ours. God's vision, as Dave was saying, God's vision is to reach out beyond our, our walls. I've often said that most church, Lutheran churches seem to be trying to reach active Lutherans who move into their community. The problem is <laughs> there aren't many active Lutherans moving in anymore. Right. Yes. You know, there are no boats coming from Norway or Sweden. <laughs> and, and, and so... Uh, uh, yeah. If we're going to reach people, we've got to reach people who are not raised um, uh, mm-hmm. Lutheran and or even Christian. And one of the things about Lutheran Church of Hope that I've so appreciated here and Mike's emphasis is that uh, this church has figured out how to reach unchurched people like no other church I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which leads right into our next topic. Yeah. What are you most excited about regarding the future of the church? 
I think that there is a growing awareness to the situation, and with the awareness, there is a gro growing openness. And I think that openness is going to allow the Holy Spirit to, uh, to lead in new ways that we can't see at this time, perhaps. But it's God's church, and God will provide. And I, I think it's just, uh, just a time for us to be uh, open to uh, new ideas, a time of prayer. And I think the Lutheran Church of Hope, and I don't mean to be self-congratulatory about this, but I think that there are ways that people can learn if they just ask themselves, what's going on and how are you doing it and uh, where, do we, where could this be used in our congregation? Well, and as a church, and Emily, you know this, uh, we've had conferences here, and we get calls on a regular basis. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we, all, we all receive these, and we're always happy to do it, because there isn't an ounce of us that wants to say, okay, well, we want hope to do well and everybody else to do poorly. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, we say and mean around here that we're on the same team with other churches. You, you get calls yeah. uh, throughout the year about uh, children's ministry, VBS, student ministry. Yep. Um, wh what... What do you see and hear out there, Emily? Yeah, you know, I think that people are people within churches are desperate to see is someone doing something that we could be doing to reach new people. And I think sometimes it's what you mentioned. It's just a willingness. And asking that is the first step. And I think that's mm -hmm. great. And we don't think that we have it all figured mm -hmm. out. But we aren't afraid to try something and fail. And mm -hmm. so we have uh, tried a number of things. And so we're always willing to share what we've learned uh, both what's worked here and what hasn't, and and that they can figure out for them if that applies to their setting and their congregation. Right. That that wraps up our two-minute drill, but it takes us right into uh, the deeper dive. And so, Merv, let's go over to you first. D say a little bit more about what you see as signs of hope. I as you think about the future of the church, given what you've seen and what you've experienced uh, in the past, you know, you talked about the, you know, around 1952 it was almost like the pinnacle, <laughs> right? That that churches were doing well in this country. Um, you know, membership was up, attendance was up, activity levels were up, uh, levels of faith were up, and then things started to turn, as you articulated in the mid to late 60s, and it's been this slow, gradual slide. And now the gradual part of the slide seems to be really, really kind of picking up steam. Yep. Uh, and there's a lot of different responses. I, wa I want to get your response to this, actually, first, Merv. When a lot of church leaders hear about that, and this podcast is certainly going to be something that church leaders are going to tune into, but, but also uh, for laity and people who are out there and are part of, of church families, or if they're outside the church looking in, maybe they're a part of that statistic mm -hmm. that has fallen away from church over the last decade or two. The response that so many church leaders have is kind of denial and pretend it isn't happening, and, um, or even to suggest that this is good. That, that we have this remnant, and you write about that in, in yep. this paper that you recently published. Uh, talk some more about that, about that reaction, about that. Re what's your response to that response that says it's a good thing that we're in decline? Well, I don't think it's a good thing we're in decline. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, Lauren Mead, who you're quoting once in Future Church, said there's three responses to, to a paradigm change. One is denial. Mm -hmm. which I see everywhere. Mm -hmm. And second is let's go back to the good old days and you know, give me that old-time religion. And the third one is be proactive. And what I'm arguing is that we need to be pro proactive. I heard uh, somebody speak one time who said, you're only one new idea away from transformation. Mm -hmm. And I found that that's been kind of my ministry is, is we found some new ideas, and then I came to Hope 17 years ago, and uh, Lutheran Church of Hope has had more new ideas than any place I've seen. So that's what gives me hope. I see new ideas breaking out around mm -hmm. the church, not in, not in all congregations, but there are pockets where I'm, I'm hearing stories of, of new life breaking out. And uh, uh, my daughter is the new director of church, uh, church center at St. Olaf College, and she is finding new ideas for the church, and, and we talk about this a lot. I, I'm just finding um, uh, 
I have a nephew who interned here with Mike, uh, Zach Thompson, and a church in, in Twin Cities, which is really exploding. And so I see this new life breaking out around as I'm in touch with people, and that's what gives me hope. As you see, um, uh, I just got an email from Peter Marty, who's a good friend of all of us here, and he's talking about the new life breaking out in his church, and I thought, in Davenport, I thought, that's really great to hear. It is. It, it really is. And when it happens, we celebrate. That's right. Uh, Dave, when you, you, you have your doctorate in ministry, earned doctorate, and so does Merv. Uh, you guys think about this stuff a lot. Um, you, your doctorate is in preaching mm-hmm. uh, and homiletics. Uh, wh- what, what, do you, what do you see out there in terms of, of preaching uh, into a world that maybe isn't as receptive to the gospel as they used to be? Well, I think it's a real opportunity. I think that uh, people have to be aware and in tune of what's going on in the world, to face it realistically, and uh, I think to reflect upon what Jesus means to us. What, what difference has Christ made in our lives? What difference has Christ made in the lives of people who come? And um, to... Um, communicate that gospel again. And I think the gospel never changes, but the way that it's presented and, uh, and the way it connects from one generation to another is different. And I, I, think, I think there needs to be an openness uh, regarding how we do church, but an openness as to how we communicate the gospel. And uh, I, I I think that it's it's really a time for imagination and a time uh, of real dependence upon the presence of the Holy Spirit uh, to guide and to direct and to uh, lead uh, people. So uh, God is still in charge. God loves His church and uh, the ministry that that we have in Christ is precious and. Uh, I uh, we are not alone in this. No, we're we're not, and I feel like it's uh, something that we are really blessed here at Hope to be able to see. Uh, we're mm-hmm. we're well aware that it isn't us that's doing this; that it's God that's doing it for us and through us, and we're just along for the ride. I think that's a real important distinctive because if if we turn this into okay, let's just figure out the three things we got to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and program it into everything we do, and then and then we're going to be able to to build a church. We're going to be able to grow a church. We're gonna we're gonna turn these trends around, right? And the statistics will start to fall in our favor. The, I think the danger of that is we fall into a technocratic uh, kind of ditch where we lose uh, the power of God in the midst of it all. I'm fond of saying we really have two choices as a as a church, and to oversimplify it, but to make the point. One is we can try to manufacture our own wind, and you know if if the church was a big giant sailboat and there's a there's a sail there, we can all get the whole congregation together on the count of three, everybody blow right, <laughs> you know just pour into it as much as you can, and let's see if we can get this boat moving. And I see that a lot. I, I see that a lot as I look around churches. Of everybody's trying so hard, and they're well-meaning. You know, uh, churches are trying so hard to get it going, and, and they think that there must be some magic formula or, or program or, or uh, style. But for me and for Hope, it's always been substance over style and focusing on, on mission over maintenance. And you spoke to that, of, of that we need a vision too, Merv. Uh, and I think it's important rather than try to manufacture our own wind to set our sail, to learn to set our sail to the wind of God's Spirit. And then go along for that ride. But as we go along for the ride, we start to see some things. And, and that's part of the reason that I hope church leaders everywhere who are tuning into this podcast will just get a sense of that rather than keep looking, the, the continuing to find that, that thing, that, that magic you know, formula, that it would be just more of a, okay, God, let's see what happens if you do this. And, and if whatever our setting, it could be a declining community, it could be rural, small town. But what can we do to bring the wind of God's Spirit more deeply into this community? It seems like uh, when you study the Reformation, um, Martin Luther's uh, words were spread out because of the printing press. Uh, He had somebody who published everything he did and went all over Europe because of the printing press. Without the printing press, nobody would ever heard of Martin Luther. 
Well, today it's going to be a digital revolution. And uh, it seems like the future of the church is going to be uh, with people who have un who understand the power of the digital and and the video and all of this. Uh, we're in a new age technologically, and that's going to that's the vehicle by which I think the new Reformation is going to be spread. Yeah, you you see this, Emily. You're you're sitting here at the table representing a generation that the three of us don't. I don't represent your generation either. I just want to be clear <laughs> that, that we have several generations represented. Mm -hmm. But um, that the digital thing is both intimidating but also encouraging, isn't it? I mean, intimidating because it's doing things in a way we haven't done before as a, as a yeah. church, but also encouraging. Um, you know, I'm I'm told that more people end up worshiping with hope and or you know listening to the messages that we preach here online and digitally all over the country and sometimes all over the world mm -hmm. than actually show up in the building and my first reaction to that is that's not what we want yeah. we we want people to be here in person yeah and we do it's yeah. i think it's a better experience it's like you know theater's always better in the room right than just watching it on a screen mm -hmm. but there's still some hope in that and there's encouragement because the key is getting the gospel out right i th i think that that's what keeps standing out to me is that that is the key. And so we're sitting here talking both to church leaders or, or people uh, outside the church potentially listening in. And you listen to us talk about being innovators in like huge ways and music and uh, trying to expand buildings. The whole point of all of that is to preach the gospel and to make heaven more crowded. It's not just to make our church more crowded. And yeah. so yeah. our hope is that we know to live that out fully and to be the church together, it's best to be in community and to be here having a conversation. Uh, but reality is that we can't always all do that. And there are circumstances that make it that way and so if we can reach out digitally that's just another outreach that we can do and it's all to to proclaim the gospel yeah it, j just even hearing that whatever we can do as as a congregation and as a part of a bigger church uh, which is all the churches out there mm -hmm. that proclaim christ as as savior and lord and believe in a god who's father son and holy spirit uh you know luther said satis est it's enough that we agree on these things you know, the foundations of our Christian faith, then all the things that are distinctives beyond that, they just make us better collectively mm -hmm. as a church. I think, you know, different branches reach different birds. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's that, it's, it's that vision to, to imagine what it's going to look like from happily ever after back, from mm -hmm. the kingdom of God where, you know, we are together for eternity. And maybe there's some people there because we planted some seeds and heaven is more crowded uh, because of some of the seeds that we planted, God used those to to stir up a saving faith. I don't know how that how how you respond to that, but when I hear Emily say that and kind of summarize our conversation here today, uh, that fires me up. I mean, I'm I'm ready to go. I'll, I'll I'll I'm willing to try and to innovate like you guys have. You were willing to really take risks and and, and to go out there and do things that nobody else had been doing. You know, mm -hmm. you talk about John Yilvesacker, Merv, being this Lutheran musician, but. People weren't playing his music at worship on Sunday. They were doing it at Bible camps or at youth gatherings. And, and so you brought that stuff into Sunday morning worship, um, and that was a risk, right? Um, so thank you for that. And Dave, <laughs> you took a risk by starting a, another campus and opening up the whole multi-site thing to Lutherans. Um, what, what is it that motivates you? You've both talked about it a little bit, but maybe let's wrap up with that today. Um, you know, we could talk for hours about these things, and we do. Usually when the three of us get together, uh, some of the admins outside of my office, they can, you know, they come in and knock on the door and say, could you guys tone it down a little bit? Because <laughs> it gets a little raucous. What is it that fires you guys up? What, 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 what's your hope for the future, and, and why is it that we should go the extra mile to do these things as church, as church people? I think curiosity is a big word to me. I'm curious as to how the Spirit is working and how this is unfolding, and uh, curious about what I see going on here at the Lutheran Church of Hope and in this past weekend about the, the crucial topics that you were mentioning and the way that impacted people and the response that's coming in about that. I, 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 
the church is not dead. The church is alive. God is alive in the Holy Spirit. I'm just curious how this is going to take shape and, and who's going to have the opportunities to be uh, working with God in, in, in making uh, heaven more crowded, I guess is the way. Amen. Yeah. And that's why we call you Yoda. Obi-Wan? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I've talked a lot about Christian imagination. Uh, we sometimes lose our imagination. And uh, what I really am excited about is when I see Christian imagination here and elsewhere as people are uh, using their gifts and their talents and their wisdom and their uh, spiritual gifts in, in ways that, uh, that are new. And so uh, I, I just love the imagination here. I still remember the day, Mike, when you walked in my office I don't know how many years ago, and said, all the food shelves in Des Moines are empty. We got to do something. And I thought, oh, here we go again. <laughs> Mike's got an idea. And he said, uh, uh, yeah, he said, Sunday, when everybody comes to church, I'm going to ask them to go to the grocery store and come back with food. Okay, uh, let's try it. So we did it. And uh, while we're still doing it today, hundreds of tons of food come in here. Um, that's imagination. And I really, uh, we need to employ all of our Christian imagination uh, on behalf of the gospel and to serve the needs of others. That's awesome. Let's uh, let, let's go to our uh, our closing, the mic drop moments. I, there have been so many here for me uh, in the last half hour. Or so, Emily, uh, what stands out for you? Has there been a, a mic drop moment that you've heard in today's conversation? Yeah, I. I just like reflecting on the risks that you guys uh, have taken and imagining what risks there are ahead. And I think that they're all worth it uh, because we're trying to make heaven more crowded. And so I think uh, that it's tremendously important to to recognize that we're just holding on to the Holy Spirit's guidance and we're uh, we're willing to be risk takers. And there's there's a lot of great stuff that comes from that. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah, and on behalf of, of uh, the whole church, whether they know it or not, again, I just want to say thank you for your willingness to take those risks. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're on your coattails here at Lutheran Church of Hope. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you've made it a lot easier for us. I'd like to think that uh, you know those of us who are here that God has called to be leaders would be willing to take those risks if you hadn't done it. Mm-hmm. But the fact that you did makes it so much easier mm-hmm. for us. Um, we... Any, any church that's going to do anything like that is going to get criticized, and we certainly do too. And we're okay with that. We don't lose a lot of sleep over it. Um, but we're trying, to, we're trying to do this in a way that's faithful uh, to our audience of one. And doesn't mean we always get it right, that's for sure. Um, but we certainly are, are making that our goal. The mic drop moment for me today uh, is just the things that you said there at the end. And this is why I probably look to both of you as spiritual fathers uh, and mentors in my life, is because you are passionate about the things I'm passionate about. But but you articulated it with one word each there at the end. Dave, you said curiosity, and Merv, you said imagination. And those are two things that um, God put in me in pretty heavy levels, I mean, pretty big doses. I'm curious what the church can do to turn these numbers around. I'm curious the way God's going to do it, because I don't think God's wringing his hands up in heaven over the state of the church. I I think he knows it's going to come around. History shows us this too, that the pendulum swings. So something's going to happen. Revival's going to come. I'm curious what that's going to be. I'm kind of like a surfer looking for that wave. Um, And there have been some really fun waves that we've been able to ride here uh, for the last few decades. Uh, And then the imagination part is just... uh, (laughs) I had a teacher in kindergarten who uh, took my mom and dad aside and said, um, he's, he's, uh, I'm a little concerned about him because his imagination is so colorful. <laughs> it, it's so big. We're not quite sure what to do with all his dreams and his, his imagining of things. You know, we hand out a, a thing for kids to color a duck and he turns it into a whole story about a, anyway, that's just me. But uh, imagination and curiosity, I, I would hope that uh, anybody listening, church leaders, church members, people on the outside of the church looking in, that you would um, that you would re 
uh, ignite that uh, curiosity for what God is doing, the creator of the universe is doing in your life and through the churches that are around you, uh, and that you would imaginatively uh, pursue those things. So thank you, Dave. Thank you, Merv. As always, thank you, Emily. Thanks to our crew, to Chris and to Brendan. You guys are the best. Uh, They have moved mountains to get this thing going, (laughs) and we are in awe uh, of that. So, And thanks to all of you. Stay tuned, and we will be coming back to you real soon. God bless. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for Pastor Mike Drop. We would invite you to click the red subscribe button on YouTube to catch future episodes. And in the meantime, we hope you can join us for worship. We'll see you then.